Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, cool. <laughs> okay. Wow. I like the windows open. I'm always surprised when people come back. It's just such a nice thing. <laughs> I'm always that person who doesn't think people are going to come to her party, you know. And then 15 minutes after it starts, the parking lot is kind of big hole, you know what I mean? But no one gets there before the time. <laughs> just come early so you can relieve our stress. All right. So, um... The center, let's have some silence. Do a little bit of centering and a great meditation. And and as always, let's set our intention for our participation this evening. Mindful of your breath as you relax. And as we center and as we are gathered here and reminded of the silence that, that is so loud with all of the other sounds, all the other distractions, everything that happens from the scratches on the table to the birds outside to people walking into the room, to our own thoughts as we release each one we say hello and then we release it and let it go knowing that we're only here now in this present moment having only the best intent for participation with joy, with love. And I know that there is this one presence in the universe that is greater than all things, and all things are great. And that is the one spirit, the spirit of the divine. And I know that I am one with that spirit. I know that my presence here tonight is evidence of that spirit, as is the truth for each and every one here this evening. And as we release these words with a flow of love and gratitude, Together we say, and so, so it is. is. It is. So um, before we do a brief summary of going back and coming up, um, anything struck some, anybody over these two chapters? Can you speak up a little bit? Yes. Thank you. Do you want me to get the mic? It might be helpful. Okay. Yes. Keep going, Kate. Okay. Yes, I, Selena. I, I, <laughs> I had some things, a couple of things I wanted to share before you get on the roll. Um, <laughs> this is about faith. Uh, last week, when I was watching the news that the hurricane was headed towards Florida, I just kept saying over and over and over, it's not going to be as bad as they're saying. It's not going to be as bad as they're saying. And I was saying that for everyone, and also for my son and daughter-in-law who were in Orlando, I was saying, I know they're going to get out before the storm. I know they're safe. I know they're going to get out before the storm. So they had made plans about six months ago to fly to Austin, Texas for the weekend because it's my daughter's birthday and they were all going there to a music festival, and so their plane got canceled on Thursday. Thursday. I mean, it was canceled. I guess they knew about it before Thursday because they got in their car and they drove all the way from Orlando, Florida to Austin, Texas. 16 hours of driving, but he wasn't going to 
to fall back on his agreement to be with his sister for her birthday. So I was really proud of him for doing it. Yeah. And so that was that was just really made me feel really happy. And uh, I was in the reading. I was I love these new terms that Emma Curtis Hopkins has for the name God. She's saying, uh, calling it the waiting adequate. And I think that's just a, a wonderful term. Say it again. The, the waiting adequate. And then she calls it the obedient supreme presence. And how exciting that is to think that we have a presence that we can use that's obedient to our wishes, our needs. Right. I mean, that's that just it's so exciting to me. And then the, the last one was unknown, unseen knower. Right. Unseen knower. So these are kind of like new ways of describing spirit or God. So I just thought that was just really wonderful. Great. In fact, they're very old ways of describing the great spirit. Well, they're new to me. <laughs> new to you. New to all of us in some ways, I think. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. And I'm glad your family is there. Thank you. Anyone else have any comments on the reading? It was a lot, and it's fairly intense, especially with the homework, perhaps. <laughs> Following up with what Selena said, the one word that popped for me in the faith <coughs> chapter was covenant, covenant with. Mm -hmm. And I ended up thinking, gee, what am I covenanting with? What am I <laughs> keeping my mind with? And after <coughs> finishing the chapter, what came into my really feeling, I choose to covenant with faith, confidence, command, firm firmness in one principle. Good God. Nice. So that's what I got out of Nice. Yeah? Anyone else? Any questions? No other comments? I think it's really powerful, two chapters, actually. Four and five are just kind of stunning. Because mm -hmm. there's all sorts of revelations that come through about spirit and about faith and about who we are and how we make our our covenant which reminds me of that Jim Carrey movie you know the one where he makes a covenant with the guy to say yes to everything yeah. and he's like I broke my There's covenant somebody. and the guy's like there is no covenant okay, so. <laughs> it's all in our head right that's what that's what the whole point of that show was it's all what we believe in how we act on what we think is the truth. So um, that's a great movie for that kind of stuff. Have you seen it? <laughs> What's the name of it again? What's I think the name it's of Bruce it? Almighty. Bruce Almighty. Bruce Almighty. Is that it? Or was it now? No. No. Uh, no. Is that that he says yes to everything. Yes, man. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes, man. Yeah. That's the one. <laughs> That's it. So um, we're talking about faith, but before we do, let's do a brief summary and bring us up to date because it's important not to focus right on the current thing, but to take it all together in context because that's how she that's how she wants it to be done, right? And so first is that we are seekers of the truth. And that we recognize that there's this one supreme being, this, this, this benevolent spirit in a way, this obedient what, enterprise out there that's out there working for us. But we're seeking the truth for ourselves. And then we recognize it through negation. right? And so we say things like, there is no, or it's not as bad as, or what else? What are some people's negations? Uh, there's no absence. There is no absence. There's no pain. Whatever. What's that? No pain. There is no pain. And then we went into that. We followed the affirmation up with the affirmation. And anyone want to share their affirmation? 
There's always peace and love in my life. Right. So there's always peace and love in my life. Breezy's looking. I'd like to hear hers. I'm looking for it. <laughs> I, know I, I wrote, remember it. I know I wrote something on it, but I don't know what it was. While she's looking for it, I'll read one. Go for there, it. There's no time. I have more than enough time to do the things I need to do. Right. Right. Mine was, I, I believe, or maybe it was a different one recently, there are no obstacles in my path, right? Mm -hmm. So what would it, your affirmation be? Oh, my affirmation. There are no, I'm sorry. There are no, I'm looking at Greasy. I, I want her to say her. So well, I didn't, I didn't have that one on four. I had it on three, but I didn't have one on four. Oh, uh, what is it for three then? Uh, I have an amazing abundance in all things. Yes, and the last one was actually about health. Oh, uh, I am amazingly healthy and fit. Yes, yes you are. Yes, you are. Um, so it, there are no obstacles in my path. Um, I know that my decisions are, um, I don't know, um, let me think here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there are no obstacles in my path. I know that so I know that my path is, is clear of all obstacles, or that there is nothing that hinders my progress. Or is that that's all basically negative still, isn't it? Mm -hmm. there's, there's still a negative in it. Well, your path is clear of all things. It's clear. My path is clear of obstacles. Just that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. right there. Yes, and not focus on that anymore. Yeah. Yes. So there you go. My path is clear. That's <laughs> <laughs> difficult sometimes to really come around to what the affirmation is, yes. My negation was uh, there is no struggle, and then so my, my affirmation was I am guided by the divine, and I accomplish all my goals with ease and grace. Right. Nice. Nice. I like that. I like that. Yeah. I, like that. I know in my own journal there's there much more like <laughs> much more fluidity <laughs> in my words than there is here this evening. Anyone else want to share? Oh, yes. There is no lack. Linda. Abundance is mine. <laughs> I don't know. Ever since I've met her, I've wanted to call her Janet, and so sometimes I still do, unfortunately. But, okay, say it one more time. There is no lack. Abundance is mine. Excellent. Yeah. Anyone else? No? Okay. So, we went there, and so which affirmation is forgiveness. Do we all still see how when we do the affirmation, we are forgiving of self? And that makes sense, right? Because I don't think we talk about it that way in terms of science of mind per se, right? We just say we have to forgive everyone, make sure you forgive yourself. And then, um, but we don't actually say that affirmation for yourself is actually forgiveness. Yes? Another way that, that Emma Curtis Hopkins puts the forgiveness thing is that she changed the wording around to give for. Mm -hmm. And so she said, like, if you're grumpy, I don't remember the exact words, but like, if you're grumpy, then spirit can replace that, give something in place of that, like, for, give for. Right. Give you something like cheerfulness in place of the grumpiness. And she was talking, that, that was what I got out of her meaning of forgiveness. Right. Nice. So that was different, too. Nice. I like that. Yeah. You and I must be on the same track, because I came up with for to give instead of forgiveness, <coughs> replacing yeah. forgiveness. So it's a whole switch. Right. That's nice. Okay. I think we're moving in a nice place. So um, also what it does is, in my mind, it removes the question of that paradox that we were talking about a few weeks ago. <coughs> the paradox mm -hmm. that, that there's a seeming negative Yeah, in that our there's world. this concept of duality, that there's duality. black and white, good and evil, yeah. right? 
yeah. starving, well fed, all of that is that is that through this step, through the effort, the negation, the affirmation, and the forgiveness part of it, is that I feel like it 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 doesn't maybe it doesn't remove that, but it it changes that concept of that paradox of those pairs of those opposites. It re it removes it for me anyway. Because once I negate something and then affirm it, it's gone, then it's just not there, right? So in that sense, we're using that concept for our own self-growth, but in reality, it doesn't exist. And we use it because we're human, because we fall back on those cliches, because they make us feel safe. Mm -hmm. Anybody want to disagree or agree? Agree. Agree. Okay. So I'll, on I go. Okay. So, and so then we move into faith. And on page um, 57 to 58, well, first of all, on 51, she says, the axiom of this fourth lesson is that the mind will demonstrate as much greatness as it has courage to stand by its intention which is a very, very powerful statement. The mind will demonstrate as much greatness as it has courage to stand by its intention. Uh, can you tell me um, which little heading it's under? You know what, it's at the first pair, bottom of the first paragraph of Lesson 4. First okay. Page. At the very bottom of that first Where it paragraph. says Moses wrote? No. That's what mine says. It's, it's, it's under it faith, the foundation. This, this sentence here. Okay. I know. Mine says it's the Moses very first wrote. paragraph. No, the first mm -hmm. paragraph. Is the first oh, I thought paragraph. you said the last paragraph. The last no, I said paragraph. First, paragraph. First. first paragraph. Ah, gotcha. Okay. okay. The axiom. Okay. So, a question. Yes. What would your definition be of mind? Hmm. My personal definition would be moved? No, for the class. I mean, for, 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 from this book. <laughs> or your personal. I, I don't, any will do. <laughs> <laughs> because I've always had a struggle with that. I always, and I'm not going to go into it until. I, I think, this is, this is what I think. And I think, I believe that it's similar to what, um, Ernest Holmes teaches, and what I've, I've learned here is that, and then we all have our own interpretation, I know, but for me it's that I'm that individual, there, you know, if the circle is infinite and I'm that dot within the circle, I'm of the circle itself, and so my mind is infinite. All this knowledge is around me. And so I have, as I learn to control my thoughts and to work with them and use them for my benefit, health, wealth, and happiness, then um, that's the mind. I control what I put out into the infinite. So if my mind is, um, my mind will demonstrate as much greatness as it has courage to stand by its intention, which says, to me, that if I want to be rich, do I really have the faith that that will happen? Do I have the courage to make it so? And I don't know what rich really is. You know, now we have an example of a multi-billionaire, and it's like, I don't want that, right? I don't want the Clinton Foundation money either. So I don't want that life. So again, I'm back there going, what is it that I want if I want to be rich, right? How does that look for me? So that's, you know, do I have the courage to stand by that conviction once I identify? I had the courage to stand by getting my PhD. I knew exactly what that looked like. I saw it in a vision before I ever applied to the college program. I knew I was going to, I knew exactly how it was going to happen. And when things didn't unfold in the right way, I was in the chair's office throwing up. Yeah. And, and she was like, I can't help you. And I'm like, but that's not the way it's supposed to happen. <laughs> and then in the very end, on the very day that I walked the stage, um, stuff shifted. And the person in my vision who was supposed to hood me 
walked up to me and she said, I'm so sorry about the loss of your chair. She goes, would it be okay with you if I hooded you? Because <laughs> yeah. I knew when I got the hood that I had to get go down, and I'm short, and so and she's smaller than I am, and so I had to go down so she could put it over my head and not hit the hat. And I knew it was Lonnie, and, and then they kept changing my chairs, and I kept saying, I'm supposed to have Lonnie. And they were like, no, you're going to have Judith. No, now you're going to have Deb. No, and then Judith moved to London. I thought, now I'm going to get Lonnie. And then, and then I got um, Dr. Deb LaPointe, and then um, she transitioned and, um, uh, just a, a week or so before graduation. And then Lonnie was the one who looted me. Courage and conviction of your opinion, of your mind. Yes, so you had your hand up. No, you did. Yes. What? I'm totally ignorant to this. What does it mean, does it mean when you're hooded? Oh, when you're awarded your PhD, you get the, it's called a hood, but it's really kind of a neck sash type thing. The further you go in school, the sillier they make you look. Pardon? Yes. So the further you go in school, the sillier they make you look. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> exactly that. Six point hats, hoods. I know, it makes it sound like you're the, you know, with the KKK or something. <laughs> I found that Emma's, that statement really helps me with, because I always thought of mind lowercase m and mind uppercase m. And again, that sort of duality of one was not so good. <laughs> and so this, for me, levels it out. It's like there is no. Great. Good. So now there's just capital M? Yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. In track training, they have you go back and capitalize everything to do with spirit, mind, God. Yeah. Yeah. And so they're always drawing lines through the lowercase stuff, you know. So, and now I tend to capitalize everything. It's like crazy. But, um, and then academically, <laughs> that's a mistake. <laughs> People let me know. <laughs> anyway, so the mind, does that help me? Mm -hmm. Okay. So would you say that mind and consciousness are the same thing? Hmm, that's a good question for this group. What do you all think? You yeah. guys share it then maybe, and then I might what I, tell you what I think. Because we're one mind, but we're individualized points within it. So what do you all think? That's what essentially what I think. Hmm. What do you think, Cheryl? You're thinking about it. No, I'm waiting for Michael to say what he wants to say. <laughs> 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 okay. Go ahead. Yeah. This is where I think this mind, you know, mind will demonstrate, it means this individual mind. Because if I go down, it says our way of believing deep down in our convinced mind. So that has to be our thoughts, our beliefs, versus consciousness, which to me is, is different. Okay. Consciousness is more awareness. It's, it's this, 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 this mystery. Okay. Um, while mind, and that's why I'm had, I'm struggling with mind, because from the way I'm seeing it here, it is definitely my thoughts and my belief systems as opposed to consciousness. Right. Okay. So what do you, I'm I'm thinking that consciousness is an aspect of mind. What mind is the generality. And, and yet there's the capital M and the small m. So the, the larger mind is the umbrella over everything. And then we have, and then we're individual aspects of that larger mind, our all individual minds, of which consciousness is a part. And aware consciousness and subconsciousness and everything else, thoughts and everything else. But it's still part of the mind, different aspects of the mind. Okay. Okay. Yeah, come on. For me, <clears throat> it, 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 it's funny when you said we started on capital M, lowercase m, so I did got to mean that 
capital M mind feels to me like it's um, spirit individualized. So it's 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 the point of spirit, which is us. And then this lowercase mind would be the word that I was struggling with was awareness, which be it said, and it's what is in front of us consciously right now. And then then that led me to capital M, capital I, capital N, capital D, which is the one that which we are all, that which is one. Mm -hmm. And that being the mind is within the universal mind. Okay. What do you think, Selena? What was your question? <laughs> um, I think that, I mean, mind, to me, mind and consciousness, are all, it's all woven together. And, and awareness is part of that, you know, it's part of the consciousness. But to me, it's all kind of woven together. Right. Which is what science of mind teaches. Don't you think? I think so. I, I think in this area of mind that she's teaching us to use our, our personal mind in order to affect our circumstances. Right, right. Which, it, once we affect our circumstances, affects race consciousness. Right. Right. So right. Does more. everyone understand what that means? <laughs> um, According, it's all if we're looking at it's science of mind, I don't like the big M and little M, but I, I get confused if it's big M and little M because it's all one. There's only one mind. Right. Right. So, so that's what, that's part of the paradox, though. It's it's one mind, and yet we're individualizations of that one mind, and we each have an individual mind, and yet we're still one mind. Yeah. So and also, too, you've got your scientific terminology for it, which would be <coughs> just mind, and that has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Right. So you know, you've there's got a lot of different, different uses. Right. How many of you have listened to the original um, Science of Mind since Barbara put it out on CD? Fascinating, isn't it? To actually hear it like that. Because it's the mind that controls everything. And um, it's like our legs and hands and stuff don't work when they're separated from our body. Mm -hmm. And be because it's the mind that operates them in terms of movement, and it operates all of our organs, even though we appear like we don't consciously, we're not consciously aware of our breathing, right? Mm -hmm. it, that breathing is happening because our mind is functioning. And I've been, I'm teaching, co-teaching a class with the psych teacher, and I'm like, OMG, <laughs> this is amazing. But they don't, do, he doesn't even, he's not even aware of what he's teaching, and yet he's teaching all these concepts about science of mind because he's like saying that very thing to the class. He's like, here's all of this, and here's the neurons, and this is how it happens, and if this is damaged, this is what's going to happen over here. And but we don't believe that that's damaged. We just, you know, we kind of like take that a step further. And so, I just think it's fascinating. It's like, and that's where exactly where I was going to go because how many of you believe that you've had demonstrations in your life, right? And so, um, Emma Curtis Hopkins says, keep practicing the small ones, keep practicing with faith those little ones that you know you can create, and soon you'll be able to control the weather, right? Because it's all one mind. Isn't that fascinating? So it might be raining across the street, or maybe you want it to rain in your yard and not across the street. You're the gardener. So um, <laughs> but that we can do that, much like your thought process, and probably not only yours, was assisting many, many, many people in Florida. Yeah, if there's a you know, mass consciousness and everybody was having the same intention, 
and the same thoughts, we could definitely do a lot to change the right. path of a hurricane. So that brings us to that, that paradoxical discussion about then why is there so much um, disconcerting issues happening in the world right now? We can't make up our mind. We can't make up our mind? Quite. What else do you think? Race consciousness. It's race consciousness. So, and so if, if we just say, oh, then that's race consciousness, does that mean that it has power over us? If you let it. If you let it. It's, it's, it's what the, the majority of the people pay attention to. Okay. I, mean, I, I, I truly believe that um, Matthew was uh, as powerful as it was because it was all over the freaking news, everywhere, all the time. Uh -huh. and, I mean, it was, it, it's where we were putting our attention. Right. So that brings you to us back to Ernest Holmes, who says, finally, the one person who um, stands against, no, who stands no, for, for nothing, but for against. Every, for everything for, and against nothing. For everything and against nothing. That's yeah. it. Yeah. From the Sermon on the Mount. Right. Yeah. That's a great line, too. So, the where does that, that take you and your faith? What? The rest of that is that, and I will show you the next avatar. That's true. That's right. And who is that? It's us. It's That's us. Right. <laughs> That's right. It is us. Because there's only one mind. I love how circular all this is. So, um, <laughs> so the question is back to you. It's what is your faith? And I ask you all to journal and to come prepared to share something that you had possibly written or if you had any insights about writing about your own faith. So I know a couple of people did that. Did others? Which tells me that, that the directions that Emma Curtis Hopkins is giving you that you're not following. <laughs> and ye yo of little faith that this is going to happen for you because these are the steps that she claims that will do that and raise your awareness. And Holmes based his teaching on Emma Curtis Hopkins. And so, and so where is your intention, right? That is where your faith is going to lie. It's like it stands right in your intention. Because, like she says, mind will demonstrate as much greatness as it has the courage to stand by its intention, and that is a definition of faith. So what is your intention? Yeah, yeah. So just to answer the question in general, okay. I had an interesting uh, experience, which I'll get to the answer. So a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago, I decided I was going to let my hair grow. I haven't gotten a haircut, I usually cut it myself, I haven't done any of that. Just let it grow. The day after I said I was going to let my hair grow, a big patch of it fell out. The next day, <laughs> overnight, it's, which is really annoying. Everybody used to have an issue with whatever, but it happens all the time. You say you're going to save money and then the car you know, so that kind of thing. All right, you know, and... Um, and I tried loving it, you know, and you know, I love myself, I'm not tense, and my hair would fall out if I get really, believe me, I'm not tense these days. And, and so the big thing, actually, the bottom line is, um, I'm comfortable with being able to demonstrate stuff. If I need new musical equipment, it shows up, my whatever, I need a car, I need a house, what have you. But not health things. I don't go there. I'm a tech guy, I don't go there. And I made up my mind, you know, and, and, what, and the thing that came to me was, um, I think the turning point in, in my own thinking was, I said to myself, if it can fall out in two days, it can grow back in in two days. So every morning I look, you know, maybe it's a but, but with the expectation of seeing it grow back in. And right. that's a big step for me. To me, that's, that's faith. Yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. Anyone else have an experience that you'd like to share over the last week about faith? When I was writing, I was thinking about my mom. Um, very 
Christian religious, and we used to go to church three times a week. And Can you speak up a little? So uh, my mom was very um, religious in a lot of ways, and so she gave us all, um, all of us kids mustard seeds necklaces, and um, I think maybe more than once she gave us mustard seeds. Cause I also remember getting an envelope with a mustard seed in it, and like so, it was a really important passage to her in the Bible about the faith. As long as you have faith the size of a mustard seed, more of this you can do and more. And so that's always stuck with me. And um, for a long time, when I did not get along with my mother very well, I considered her religion a crutch. Like, because she, and she needed it, and I could give you all kinds of reasons why my mother needed her crutch. And I, I, res I respected it as that. You know, like, mom needs that in order to make it. Um, and so would you if you had her, you know, that was how I. Explained it, and then as I kind of got more into my own spiritual belief system and stopped being so judgy, um, <laughs> I was like, "What powerful faith she has!" Um, and just beautiful faith when I think about ways that it, uh, you know, saved my life more than once. And hopefully, like when I was little, I swallowed lye and um, burned my esophagus, and was fed through a tube for two years, and was in the hospital for like months and had over 150 surgeries and my mother had like people all over the country like prayer all kinds of churches I was on every prayer list out there and I fully believe like that saved my life mm -hmm. because of the intention of the faith of all those people and the power of their belief to save me um, and I think that that's happened at other points in my life too and it, help, it has helped me as my evolution of spirituality has come you know because I really really truly believe that there is no right story. Like, even this is a story that we're telling ourselves, but it fits my story right now, so it works for me. Right. And, uh, and my mother's story is just as good as my story. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, this is just the story that helps me right now, and I have faith in it, and it helps me to believe that things are, are good. And that's, everybody's story just helps them to find the good, I think. So, that's where I kind of went to, and have a, that was it. <laughs> Thank you for sharing all that. Mm -hmm. I think it's right on point. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyone else? I know we all have stories. We all raised your hands. But well, we've already told them twice. <laughs> 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 We're waiting to hold that third yeah, one. Yeah, third <laughs> one. <laughs> That's right. So um, Emma says on page 57, and unfortunately I don't know where it is. Oh, yes, I do. It's on page 52 under under Generating Faith in this workbook for you, Breezy. It's on page 52. About 57 in the book, it says, There is a way to generate faith, just as there is to generate electricity. It's very simple. Do nothing but speak the truth and stand to it. My page 52 is in lesson three. Then I, I, I can't help you anymore. Generating faith, that's what I need. It's that's weird that the 61. teacher's manual <laughs> and the student manual is going to be different. <coughs> okay, so it's as simple as the electricity has always been there, our faith has always been there, it's just whether or not we turn it on and how strongly we believe the light's going to come on. How many times have you turned on the light switch only to have the bulb flicker and go out? Has that happened to anybody? <laughs> what is your immediate reaction? Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> like, or you stand there in the dark and go, ooh, right? Is there some like disappointment? And it's the same thing that happens when we, when we really believe and we want something and then it doesn't manifest or we thought that we were going for it, but it's still not within our grasp. Mm -hmm. I look at it all in, in essentially the same way. That it's like, and then you try the light switch again, right? Mm -hmm. Even though you know it's out, you try it two or three times, you know. <laughs> and then you look at it like, gone. But maybe, maybe it was just loose. Have you had that experience where you went to take it out, but you turned it in and the light came on? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. Was it your faith? I don't know. Right? This is just an analogy I thought of right now. 
Or is it a metaphor, David? <laughs> <laughs> I think it could be our faith. Because then I go, because I know when I've been really um, poor in my past, and I'm like, I don't, I can't afford a light bulb, right? I can't get in the car to drive to Walmart to get the light bulb. And, um, and then it comes back on, and I'm like, thank you, God. <laughs> so whatever that is, I feel like I've been cared for many, many times over and over and over, because I believe I'm going to be cared for, even though there's this superficial thing that I, I keep expressing fear. Right? So, um, so there's that. See, the chairs are too low for me, which is why I stand, even though we have a table. So, so can, what about John so Stool? No. Okay. So <laughs> Why are we the only two laughing at that? I don't know, but that's funny. <laughs> so, uh, so the idea of, of creating the reality that I expect to see. I don't know if it's true. I don't remember my early childhood. Uh, stuff about early childhood, but I believe that I heard that children learn to expect to see the world in a certain way, and they can't really distinguish until they kind of learn that. Like, right. this is me and this is not me, you know, at these very elemental ways. So like, so if I go into the garage or I open the garage door, I really expect to see my car. Yeah. And it's always there, and if it's not there, either I've lost my mind or it's been stolen, and that doesn't happen very well. <laughs> but, but, but the point is, I expect to see the car, and so I have these expectations, this faith, or these expectations, and they're consistent. Right. They're consistent. You know, and so my world seems to be this continuous thing when really it's flashing in and out of existence really, really, really fast. Yes. But the way our minds, my mind, is, is programmed or conditioned. I set up an idea about something, and I hold it, and, and I have faith in, I don't know if faith is the right word, it doesn't feel like the right word, mm -hmm. but just that consistency of expecting to see something a certain way, from a quantum <coughs> point of view, that's, that's what's happening, you know, and, and if, you know, change your thinking and change the world or change whatever. And, right. So it kind of goes that. So, so to go to the mirror in the morning, going back to the whole spot, I really expect <laughs> to see the, the hair in there. I have to. Yeah. Right. You know? It yes. Is. I think um, it's kind of like going to sit in a chair. You don't think twice about, like, kind of, you don't think twice about anything. When you make something second nature, your faith is that deep, mm -hmm. that's when you have immediate things happen. That's right. That's when you just not even think about it, it just happens. That's right. So I think we do that all the time, but we just don't notice it. Right. About things. We're, yeah. I mean, right. we're so powerful, we're very limited with our five senses. There's so much more to us. We know it, but, you know, normal. Right. That's why um, Hopkins stresses repetition. That's why Holmes explains things three different ways every time he tries to get a concept across. Because of the repetition is what's important. That's why education is based on repetition, repetition, and we go over it and over it. Even though they say now we don't need to have all that repetition, right? Because we can just put it into Google and come up with the answer. So that's the argument right now in higher education. How much of the old style learning do we need? <clears throat> but my argument is if there isn't a foundation, then there's not critical thinking. And so. I don't care if they don't, you know, once they're in graduate school, if they don't remember anything, as long as they've learned a foundation so that they can critically think about the material that's being put in front of us. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing here. So she says, faith is a self-increasing characteristic. And this is on page 58. It's under generating faith. <clears throat> Probably one, two three, four, five, six paragraphs down under generating faith, but it's on page 58. Faith is a self-increasing characteristic, much as jealousy is said to be. The jealous person sits down and imagines a whole sequence of actions, then feels so strongly that what has been imagined is true. 
that he acts on his feelings and does dreadful things. His jealousy has sped itself by his thoughts until it handles him completely. Faith in goodness will also feed itself and increase itself in the same way until we rise and work miracles through it. We don't seem to handle our faith, it handles us. We become the faith that we always were since faith in God are one thing. That's a powerful paragraph. Mm -hmm. And it calls us right to our question earlier, my question for you. What is your intention? Because Emma Curtis's Hopkins, Emma Curtis Hopkins, <laughs> yeah, I know that. intention is to make each one of us healers. Not only to give you a, a few tidbits here and there so you can do a negation and an affirmation and then see some positive result, five twenty bucks in the parking lot. Her intention is that you become healers, and this is the point right now in, in her lessons that you decide if that's where you want to go. Yeah. So as a, go ahead. I was going to say, as a second part to like what I had told you all before, where so once I found science of mind, and what you say brought me to science of mind, and I came here to the center, and that's when I changed the story of being sick and learned that, oh, I'm really... Like, actually, when you stop them, like, why is somebody so pretty strong? I swallowed lie, people. And, um, <laughs> and I've not been on meds or had surgery since 2005. It was my last time from, and I had it all the way up until then. Mm -hmm. But once I, and it was this, like, once I got this, that I went, oh, I don't need that anymore. And then I don't need it anymore. So. Mm -hmm. That's it, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm not talking about going around and laying the hands <laughs> you are healed stuff. I'm talking about once we heal our own consciousness, then we become healers in the world, much like we were just talking about, you know, the mind versus that consciousness theory. It's like, what is race consciousness? Well, we're a part of that. And so how do we change that? We change us and become healers in the world. And that's where I believe M. Chris Hopkins takes us, as well as if once we heal ourselves, we can heal others as well. And she has great faith that that's true, because it's only one mind. Mm -hmm. Yes? I think, you know, for me, part of faith is being okay when it doesn't turn out the way I putting all the energy into it. I know that this is, and then it doesn't to know that there's a larger outworking and it's still okay. Right. But it takes a complete trust to have the faith in the first place. And it, it was an interesting, um, I was doing the show outdoors and I had Jennifer in the next booth and I went to get my, I had just made a sale with my phone, a little thingy on the phone. And I went back to get my phone to make another sale and the phone wasn't there and we searched all over. And I knew, I, I just had this knowing, where could it be? It could not have disappeared. I just did not believe that somebody would have walked off with it. I just could not believe it. And for hours, probably till you came to help us pack up, I, I just kept expecting that phone to show up somewhere. And we packed and we left, there was nothing there. In fact, the next week when I went back, to do the show in my same spot. I said to Jennifer, I know I'm going to find the phone in the bushes somewhere. I just couldn't believe it. So I don't know. There, were, there was something like I, I had some feeling of, I know it's going to turn up. It's fine. It's fine. <coughs> Especially at the beginning, I know that phone is going to turn up. And there was a feeling of faith and a feeling of disappointment. Well, what the hell happened? You know? I'm manifesting the phone left and right. I've got Jennifer doing it, you know? And it just doesn't, ne never did turn up. And in, in the end, I, I just like compared it to other things in my life. You know, wishing maybe for someone's help or having it not, or my own, or having it not turn out exactly like that. But it, it's never, it, it's never the finish line. There, there's always more that might happen that might put it in perspective why it didn't turn up or why the healing didn't take place. Right. So a big part of faith is being, for me, is being okay when it doesn't turn out because there's still something, a larger intelligence at work there. Right. 
So it's okay, whatever happens. Exactly. I think that's a good point to remember. And that clears something up for me because a part of me <coughs> couldn't help but being a little cynical. And maybe, I don't know, but he, w w there is no death. There is no sickness. She says that, and I, I don't mean to be this cynical, but I'm like, she's not with us anymore. You know, she made her transition. So that apparently that the bigger picture, you know, kind of helped that. That story helped that. I don't. I think she doesn't think, when she says that, she doesn't consider there is no death. We think of death as the end, or a lot of human beings do, but there is no end to right. the life force in us. So there is no death as the way we talk about it. As yeah, society talks about. Everybody yeah. Died. And the truth is, um, she's alive in this room right here tonight. Each one of us have our own interpretation of her, and you know, God, I wouldn't be surprised if she, you know, just manifested right there in the middle. <laughs> we all join hands. Well, each morning when I'm, I'm writing, writing. I'll get a Ouija board. <laughs> each morning when I'm writing, I'm like, Emma told me this. <laughs> so there is that concept as well, right? But I see what you're saying, and where that, where you, what you call your cynicism can come up because. It appears like there's a lot of stuff happening in the world right. that we can't control. We can really control this, but I think those sometimes appearances are deceiving. I don't know, though. We only do what we believe we can. This discussion has helped me to um, shift my thinking of what faith really is for me. Because I was thinking back when, before I knew anything of science of mind or whatever, when growing up I had pretty bad allergies. And so in my, into my 20s I had allergies. And I remember waking up one day and saying, I'm sick of this. I, I'm, I, don't want, I, I don't want allergies anymore. That's it. And I didn't have allergies anymore. And it was before, and so there was no thought that something else was going to help me so <coughs> it was true recognizing that I had the, it was just the power of my mind. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet, l later on, I be, if, you, if you ask me what I thought faith was, it was sort of that there was some, I guess sort of that more of the duality, that there was something else that was going to sort of step, step, but not that it was, that it was me. Mm -hmm. mm. That there is no, there is nothing else but what the thought is direct. Right. That I didn't have to pray, I didn't have to treat, I didn't have to do anything. I just had to announce, I don't want allergies anymore. And that was it. And that's powerful. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Very cool. I love that sentence. Go ahead. On page 59, where it says demonstration and experience, the line reads, just exactly what you said, our firm belief in any principle, let's say it felt, will lead to a demonstration of the power in that principle. Right. And it's just, that's and it. That, 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 no, the last part of that sentence thing. goes yeah. back to the mustard Maybe. seed, one grain will mm. move a mountain. <laughs> I like how she uses interchanges faith with firmness. Yes, I love that. I can mm. I can get that a lot easier than the word mm -hmm. faith. Standing firm. Standing yeah. firm. Holding firm conviction. Right. I guess it's because it maybe has a visual to it. Right. Where faith is just kind of a vague word that, w and especially in the South, gets thrown around a lot. Yes. Yeah. I think everywhere it gets kind of thrown away. Well, I've only lived in the South. Right now I live in the South, so <laughs> I say South too. Because Minnesota, the Minnesota Lynx, are in the WNBA finals. <laughs> <laughs> and you held no from the South to soon. It's tied. You know that, right? We have no idea what you're talking about. What's the WNBA? What? Women's. Failed. Right? Yeah, right? I was like, and then they've got their class, right? Right? <laughs> yeah, student, another class, yes. 
Okay, so the power is within, page 63. That is the heading as well. The power is within. There are 12 effects of holding firmly onto the omnipotence of spirit. You will have light, health, strength, support, defense, clear thinking, wise speech, ability to record well your ideas. Ability to record well your ideas. <laughs> Let me just, just repeat that. Joyous songs, skill in carrying out your principles, beauty of discernment, and great love. And then she goes on later. We all have unlimited power. If we don't use that power, it doesn't change the fact of its existence. Even if we speak of our weakness, the power is real and demonstrates that weakness. And so faith goes on both ends of that continuum, right? We might, and it goes back to the very beginning when I say, when we, I talk about how you think of yourself and how you, you know, what your self-esteem is, how much you value yourself. We can act as if, but if the internal voice still says that we're not a value, then then that's a contradiction. And so we have to know who we are and all of these 12 things. Who are we? Who, what is your life? How do you express life? How do you express health? Yes? So that leads into my story. So the faith part for me was the faith in myself. And so I've had these minor things over the past year. Um, my vacuum cleaner doesn't work properly. My faucet leaks. Um, my drain doesn't drain properly. And I've put them off for months because I've been telling myself I don't have the money to fix them. And so I do the affirmations for prosperity and I do all this stuff. But I still have all these things that I haven't taken care of. And so what I did this week was kind of did a come to Jesus conversation with myself. And it was like, do you have the faith to get these things fixed? Or are you just going to keep saying you don't have whatever you need to do? And so I decided that I was going to take the steps and take care of them and not worry about how it was going to look like or whatever. So, Got some support from B. Found me a plumber because it only took me a year to figure out a plumber. So I made the call to the plumber. So they're supposed to come, and I took my vacuum cleaner to be repaired. And it didn't really. It took twenty-three dollars to get fixed. And the drain, I just had to unscrew the thing and pull the hair out. So it wasn't even that big of a deal. But it was the whole conversation that these were going to be much bigger things, and so it was my decision to put actions behind all of the things that I'm doing. Clean up the mucky energy that I have because I keep looking at it and saying, I can't do it, I can't fix it, it's broken and all this stuff. So that was my faith for the week. Beautiful. Yeah. What a great note to take um, a 10 minute break now. <laughs> well done, you. <laughs> back to the tables, but um, but I, I have to because, <laughs> because this is a Holmes Institute class. So, um, so back to the question. I'm going to I'm going to keep asking that for the rest of this time because we're when we move through here these these two chapters. Um, four and five, we move into six, which we actually, she, according to Hopkins, is um, working with, beginning, understanding the secrets of how that happens. So, um, so the the foundation of our firm belief is that is that question, and the practice that we use is is what I'm I'm kind of like harping on this evening with no shame intended, because we all move and do at our own pace and what we feel comfortable with. However, there isn't any text that doesn't say that you need repetition 
if you want to advance, right? That you say the prayers over and over, that you believe, you state your faith over and over. All of the masters say the same thing, from Buddha to Christ to, you know, the Tao to everybody, to Ernest Holmes, <coughs> Emma Curtis Hopkins, Thomas Proward, Emerson, everyone says the same thing. Practice and repetition and expand your awareness to become more inclusive of difference and recognize that because it's all one mind, there is no difference. So that inclusivity is just opening up to the experience itself. Did you want, were you going to say something? I was just thinking. Dude. And so, um, so that, that is where we're going to focus on tonight. So again, I'm asking you, like, what is your faith? You know, where are you? Because as Emma Curtis Hopkins says in the book, we can manifest small things. We can manifest what appears to be negative things. We can manif we manifest things all the time, all the time. You, have, we've all manifested this, right? The direction my mind is going was based on something someone said or something I read that we've all read, and that's the group consciousness that we hold here, right? But it's not just because I'm the one talking, it's because you're all thinking. Right? Mm -hmm. And so we don't have to say it out loud. Our thought creates the reality that we live in. Thought just gives it power. Right? But our thought is powerful as well. So um, when we say it, it just brings it to form. We all know that already, so I know that, I'm assuming that makes sense for everybody. So, um, on page 81 of, but it's not, it's in this one, it's in the uh, Scientific Christian Mental Practice. She says, the mind is an axiom. She, she deals with axioms a lot, and um, which is very true in this demonstration. It is said that the mind will certainly demonstrate as much greatness, again, as it has the courage to stand by its intention. But she's saying the same thing, that faith is a self-increasing property. It's a self-increasing property that we hold as part, of our, as part of our personality or as part of who we are. Isn't that a, I think that was another interesting way, because I had never thought that my personality would reflect my beliefs or my faith, but it does. Mm -hmm. it does. Oh yeah, it does. And as I've changed over the last several years, I think that even more and more that my body, that my actual presence reflects that mm -hmm. more and more, even in other in other environments. Yeah. yeah, people seek me out who have no idea who I am, mm -hmm. and it's like, why are you talking to me? <laughs> and I think it's because of that, there's that conscious connection somewhere, and then all of a sudden I manifest in their space and they come up and talk to me, and it's like, wow, that's interesting. Right? Mm -hmm. Or I could say they've manifested in mine as well. I like being the miracle sometimes. <laughs> Don't you? Yes. Yeah, I think that's true for all of us. We all get to be the miracle as well as create them. Right? Right. Yeah, you're all kind of still like, maybe. <laughs> yes, yes, it's true. Yes. So, um, a mind as free is a mind is as free as it has the courage to deny. And so that's going back to the negation stuff. When stuff pops up, negate it and practice the affirmation and write things down. She says. The le this is on 72, Breezy, under um, lesson, it's under lesson five, it's one, two, three, it's the fifth paragraph in lesson five, on right above the power of our thoughts on 72. Gotcha. This lesson shows how essential it is, even after faith has been established, we express our new faith constantly in our speech and thought and writing. In the beginning was the word. If we don't write down our insights, we leave out an important way of radiating our healing quality. Sometimes a practitioner is astonished to find 
that they have cured a half a dozen people of very miserable conditions, and yet those cured patients don't speak of their cures or urge other people to be cured by the same means. This happens because the practitioner hasn't recorded the miracle on paper. And thus the principle so firmly in faith that when a patient is cured, the fact is so present in her consciousness that she can't forget it and she must speak of it. And it's kind of a jumble of stuff, but what it says to me is that write your thoughts down because your thoughts are powerful and writing is as powerful as saying something. Mm -hmm. And when we're writing, we can go, oh, and then we can strike it and rewrite something. We can erase it and write it again. But once something is out there, your conversations, and I've said this before, are irretrievable, they're unrepeatable, and you cannot reconstruct them. Once you've said it, it's out there. And I know Kristen, Kristen, I love you, but Kristen would argue with me that there's a moment of grace. And I agree in that sense. You can negate exactly what you've said, right? But why go there? Why go there? Why trust yourself in that way? And that, you know what I mean? As well, also, growing, too, in that mm -hmm. context, when it's being spoken, mm -hmm. people in general seem to take things a lot more personally when you speak it as opposed to reading it. And because there's a lot, you can hear the emotion and that sort of stuff in what's right. being said. And if they misspeak, you can't take back what somebody's heard. Right. You, it's some reason, for some reason, it seems where you can negate it if it's written. You can say, oh, it was, we wrote it wrong and we, we're changing that. But if it's, if it's heard, that's different. So you really can't take it back. That's a good point. Yeah. What if it's not heard? Well, that's why I said it, 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 it's not taken the same way. But you could be speaking something without anyone hearing it. So are you talking about the act of speaking? I'm talking about the act of speaking puts the energy into, the, into consciousness. That's my belief. And I, I, I think that she says something similar, maybe not that emphatically. But what she stresses is the writing. And it's the writing that puts it into form as well. And if we practice with our thoughts by writing, then um, when we go to speak them, we're much more clear. That's why I think you know, prac training is just writing one paper after another, after another, after another, so that we're clear in our own thoughts. And that's why I encourage you again, keep writing in your journals. Maintain a spiritual practice that includes writing about what you've read. Yes? Uh, I mean, for me, writing is something that's concrete. So I can look at it. I've created that. I've st that energy is still right there. Mm -hmm. That energy, I can go back and look at it and you can, you can read it off the paper. That, it's right there. So I'm holding it. You know, it's, it's there. So you know, that's just my mind. But it helps me. Mm -hmm. And it makes it more powerful and concrete in my mind. Um, Another thing that helps me is I look at the tip of the pen and then I think of like, think about how much power we have and you're putting it right there right. on that paper. Right. You know, it's... It's your wand. Yeah, exactly. It right. can be. Mm -hmm. It is. So. It's also helpful later. Like, I went back and read things from, you know, when we were house searching or whatever, you know, my list of stuff that I wanted in my house. And now I can go back and be like, oh, I have 23 things and we got 19. You know, like, but you forget some of that, and I couldn't ever count it up if I had just thought it. And now I can, it helps me to quantify and to remember, oh, things have worked out before. Right. Right. I, um, yeah, yeah, I just have, you know, my whole life is a real revelation, and I'm happy to talk about any aspect of it. So I usually have to refrain myself from telling too many stories. But, um, a while back, I but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that was called qualifying. <laughs> That's funny. I'll have to remember to tell my students that. So, um, uh, a while back, I had a car accident, a couple car accidents, and, and they decided that I had a head injury. Right, my brain sloshed around, and and it affected my memory, and. Um, and so I, I would say that. I, would, I actually have told classes that, you know, if I don't recall all your names or if I forget, you know, this is why. Like all of the stuff I learned before the car accidents, solid stuff. Like I'll be teaching until I'm 100. But the other stuff, it kind of flows. 
And I realized about two or three years ago that um, to quit telling that story to my students, for one, because, <laughs> because I still believed it. And when I stopped believing it, it was during PRAC training, and this stuff sticks in my head, right? Like other stuff didn't. And I'm really, really smart. And that was not damaged, right? It was like, oh, I'm getting my PhD, have a car accident, I'm stupid again. That's what it was. Like I could actually see that progression and why I created that so that I couldn't achieve this. I achieved it anyway, but I always felt like it was a little unqualified. But the truth is, when I quit telling that story in that way, it, it changed everything. It changed everything. And so the way we tell the story, the way we write about ourselves, affects your manifestations and the power of your word. And I think by the same token, when I stop telling the story, right. if I stop my, I remember this, I, I would do something, I'd say, oh David, you're so stupid. And I would stop myself from saying that. See, and eventually I stopped thinking that. Right. And I've done that a couple of times recently, told the story. And I think because I feel stupid. I'm feeling less than. But but I stop my 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 point is simply yeah. when I stop saying it, it, it backs up and eventually I stop thinking it and right. I stop yeah. feeling it as well. Yeah. Exactly. And it gives me time to just examine that and unpack it before I Right. Mm -hmm. it, exactly. Yeah. Right. And it's less frequent for me when yeah, it pops up. But it is. still does. Yeah. It's like a reverse affirmation. Yes. Right. But I think we all have those. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the thing. I don't think my story is unique at all. I think that, that this is what I think. I think, and I've said this to some people, you may have heard this before, that that point of impact is the same, even though we experience it differently. The point of impact is the same. So if someone has been, you know, beaten or sexually abused or lied to, the point of impact is the same. It affects our psyche, it affects our ego, it affects, we live in fear, we have a fair amount of distrust. The circumstances are different, and I'm not saying that any, all abuse is equal by any means, but I'm saying that the point of impact is the same at that point of PTSD. It's that impact is the same across the board. And so the circumstances change, but on that point of, that point of recognition is where we can heal the world. We don't have to listen to the stories. We just have to go here and say, what's the truth of this right here, right? That's where we need to go. Mm -hmm. And so that's the goal of Hopkins, but we can't get there until, until we start writing this stuff down because that's the spiritual practice is recognition. Was it in this chapter, or maybe I skipped ahead, where Emma Curtis Hopkins was talking about every healing, every person that's looking for healing has a, a key phrase or a key right and that I think was the last one yeah and it sort of goes to what you're saying about but but what you're saying sounds a little more general i mean when she said it, i was thinking oh well if it's this person there's something very very specific for this person but in some respects what i think i hear you saying is Pain is pain. Fear is fear. Uh, the circumstances. Loss is change. loss, you know, right. and so grief is grief. So if, so if I learn how to joy joy. meet that and joy is joy, that's not exactly. Me. You know, but if I learn how to meet that thing, the core element of it without the, beyond the story. Right. Yeah. Just then that's the next key stone. I'm sorry, what? I just had, it's just exciting for me because I had this exact conversation earlier today with a therapist who was having difficulty empathizing with a client. And so I went to, but have you, so you haven't experienced his pain. And do you know what pain is? Have you experienced pain? Go to a place where you've had pain and go to a place where you've been able to let that go. And can you get excited about helping him to let it go? Right. I think I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that was it. Mm -hmm. Were you going to say something? Yeah, no, I'm just thinking about what both of you said. So um, 
like in terms of like affecting the collective consciousness. Um, what I put out there, like if I'm thinking of healing something, it's, it has nothing to do with what the person's story is, what language they speak, where they live. It has nothing to do with any of that. It has to do, and I think this is what you said, that it has to do with what's behind it, the core element. Like, we're, we, all humans are capable of feeling fear, pain, joy, whatever. So it's not about the story. It's where the story brought you to that place of fear. Right. And by using that emotion and healing that emotion, regardless of the story, healing that emotion, vibrationally, you're healing it all over. Mm -hmm. Right. Right? Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, yes. I agree. Any other comments on this? Good discussion, I think. Okay. So, um, back to Hopkins. We haven't really left her. She's still alive and well. <laughs> in the middle of the room. Um, <clears throat> Because what Sue was just saying, and David, and um, my mind Laura. just went down here. Laura. Laura. Laura we're saying, there is that there is healing in the truth, whether we seek to be healed or not. There is power and beautiful prosperity in the truth, whether we ask for them or not. It works through us like a fine fire of sweetness. So let's fill our minds with thoughts of truth each day. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. Fine fires of sweetness. I just love that. I do. I just love that. So, that's four and five. So, again, here's the thing, is that we can't be ambiguous in our faith. We either have faith in it or not, right? That, I kind of believe that, and I, and I don't think I got that from Hopkins. I think that's more of a troller thing. But we can't be ambiguous in our faith. We can't go, yeah, I kind of believe that. No, I kind of really go, yeah, I kind of want a new car. Yeah, I don't know if I can really afford the payments like that. We can't, we can't hedge in our faith. We can, because... Well, you can, but it's not going to get you anywhere. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if you want to be ambiguous in our, your faith, you're not going anywhere. By our, my own judgment, and Greasy supports it. So, <laughs> <laughs> but if you want to manifest things, then you cannot be ambiguous in your faith. Right? So, in order to move forward, then according to Hopkins, we need to be clear about what our faith is in all of those 12 areas that she ran through earlier in the book. And, um, and write down, I'm just going to keep stressing that, work your spiritual practice every day. Even if you don't do Emma's, which can be quite time consuming, I think, and read all of that. If, you, if you're feeling um, pushed to um, do something else instead of read that, at least take 10 to 15 minutes to read, write, and meditate every day. Mm -hmm. At the same time every day is what they encourage. Read, write, and meditate. Read, write, read a spiritual book, not a 24-hour thing where it's just the one thing, the thought. Read a book there's, where there's continuity so that when you're writing you can see the growth of your thoughts. Does that make sense? Yes. So read 10 to 15 minutes, write 10 to 15 minutes, pray 10 to 15 minutes. Set that hour aside. Yeah. That's my encouragement for you. So, um, because as we go forward, everything is based in faith. So, repetition builds your faith. <laughs> Have I said that already? No, I'm just glad to 
He's singing the theme song. Song. <laughs> Justice League, apparently. What? Zane is humming the, the theme song to Justice League and he has headphones in, so he probably doesn't realize he's going in. <laughs> I was wondering where the sounds were coming from. Joy is joy. <laughs> okay. So, are there any any questions? There, I have a question. There was a, a paragraph in on the middle of page 62 mm -hmm. that I had to really read over and over and over and over again to get what she was saying. Hang on, let me let me find it real quick. Is which is, the the unveiling your hidden power? No, um, it's a new under a new covenant in which in lesson four or lesson page five. It's just page sixty-two. No, I know, I, but, I, I but I'm trying to look it up for Breezy's using a handbook. It's, it's foundation. It's, it's, it's under lesson four. four. Yeah, I've got a new covenant right here. Okay, covenant. under lesson four, a new covenant. Yeah, we didn't okay. get to what paragraph she's at yet. She's on the, you're on the third one. Well, it's the middle, um, yeah, the third one, yes. Okay. As we contemplate this truth, we come to understand it's not truly noble to be grave in warfare, nor to rise above the temptation to do harm to another being, nor even to be able to cure the sick and injured. By thinking wisely ahead of those circumstances, we never come into them. Oh, cool. <laughs> That's great. What is it about that? Well, it seems like she's saying that it's not really good to be able to cure the sick and injured. But that's not really what she's saying. No. no. It's to change the circumstances before that happens. It's like you don't, you don't, if you, if you keep your thoughts and keep, and keep your words on truth at all times, then you won't. You won't find yourself in that circumstance to begin with. Yeah. Right. 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 If See, that's that's really. To heal, then you'll have to find something to heal. Hmm? Yes. Mm -hmm. If you focus on wanting to heal, you'll have to find something to heal, which means you've created something that needs to be healed. Yeah, that's a cool idea. That, like the. Um, there's a teaching in the Kahuna tradition. Yeah. Um, what does the Kahuna do when he encounters a hungry lion on the path? And, it, and he, he just says it wouldn't happen. The true master never encounters such a situation. <coughs> the, the footnote at the bottom of the page explains it really well. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Did you want to? No. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've been struggling with thinking about faith is, is, and it, this just confuses it more for me than, than by thinking wisely ahead, um, is, is faith never having any doubt? or being able to work through doubt with confidence and joy. Clarity. Yes. And that's just, that's one of the things I, 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 was, I was discussing over break that one of my, my episodes of dealing with and thinking about faith this week has been involving, we, we, just, we just moved into our house. And I don't do change very well. So... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's an understatement. <laughs> oh so, so this is something that is, you know, the, the manifestation of the house, the, the actualization, the, the actually it happening are all immeasurable blessings that I am I am truly just in awe and very, very grateful for. Yet, in the midst of it, there are boxes everywhere. I don't know where, you know, I didn't know where my razor was. I don't, you know, 
I, I didn't know what clothes I didn't you know what clothes I'm gonna wear because I don't know where they are and all this stuff and 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 it seems so trivial to even sweat it because I to say that I had faith that I knew it was all gonna work out is is almost silly because of course everything is gonna be fine in short order. But the question then the thing that kept on coming to me was, well, like why this is why is this affecting, if, if I have such faith, or if I do have faith, then why is this affecting me at all? Mm -hmm. Why, you know, I was able to move through it without it, like, spiraling into anything horribly uncomfortable, at least for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I just, I, you know, it just seems like I, it, it seems like if I had true faith, it wouldn't be touching me. And so I was just wondering if anybody had any comments. Okay. Okay. Joe? What you focus on expands. That's like just listening to it. I mean, that's what I would, in simplest form, in my head, that's what I, mm -hmm. you know. So Sorry. What you focus I didn't on hear expands. what you said. What you focus on expands. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I think because of race consciousness, we're gonna have moments of doubt. But I think it was the second thing you said, moving through that doubt with clarity and confidence is the faith. Yes. And I think it's also, I think it's both. Can mm -hmm. faith be both? But they like, seem to contradict one another. Like can't, it, there, sometimes you have faith that just, there's no doubt at all. Like I just, I have faith, I know this. And then other times it's like, I have faith even though. <laughs> like I know on the other side of this it's gonna work out even if I'm getting all riled up about it and it looks like my, you know, I just think of my mm -hmm. house flooded and like the, all the water's coming down around me and I'm like, we are gonna be fine. I have no idea how it's gonna happen. I have a choice right now. I'm either gonna flip the count or <laughs> it's gonna be fine. And I am definitely going to have a drink. Um, <laughs> so, like I think, I think they're both fake. It's just going to drown the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> I, think long, I think as long as we're in this, in these bodies, in this dimension, mm -hmm. we're going to have some challenges. Mm -hmm. And that can bring up some doubts. I agree. I think that just but, be, you know, we're just, we're, we're also human. We're spiritual beings, but we're also experiencing this dimension. Right. And we're dealing with things right. so it's just natural I mean it's just part of human nature right Tama Chodron would say again going back to places that scare us or whatever the name of that book is when you're walking the path of the spiritual warrior you acknowledge it and you say oh look at that there's doubt and then you go I have you know over here is faith and you just keep walking mm -hmm. you just keep going I, I think what you're talking about Mike is the the, the path of the enlightened would be, no doubt. Mm -hmm. That's not where any of us are. I think you heard that. Feel to question. And when we're unsure, then some of that doubt's going to be there. And I don't see that as, and then we, then we can negate it, affirm, and go on. I like to laugh at myself. You silly bird. You just had this whole thing happen. Because I don't want to give it any more energy. Right. It's there, it happens, and I'm still working it out, you know. And, but, you know, I laugh at myself a lot because I can be really silly. It's like, look at all of this. My whole world. It's, <laughs> it's incredible. And I get all bent out of shape because there's crumbs on the counter. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but we're but we're aware. She wants to that's that's to the key. Right? <laughs> <laughs> we're aware of what, you know, mm -hmm. and that's a huge thing. I think it is too. Of, of how you're feeling, because you know, some people just go through it and not even think about is this faith or this doubt or you know, they don't even think about. It. They just. Yeah. I agree. Just let it. <laughs> I think that's. I think that's the path right there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sir. 
I think um, one of the things that um, I guess I could say bothers me in um, you know all of this and for years is when um, this the standard is set so high that when we feel angry or uncomfortable or anything, there's shame attached to it. I should not be feeling this way if I am really a spiritual being. And like what you said, it's, it's part of the human condition to be going through the things we're going through. And it's all spiritual, even what you were feeling. But to feel like, to, to question one's faith because you're going through a circumstance that very circumstance might be one of the opportunities to look at something and find something great and like, wow, you know, like, look what this just helped me find out about myself, you know, but it's none of it is bad. None of these feelings that seem negative right. are anything to be ashamed of. And I really, especially when people, you know, become ill or you know, have ill fortune in some way, and say, like, but what did I do? You know, what did I do to create this? And what did I, there may be a scientific reason with the cause and effect thing and everything, but there shouldn't be shame around it. There right. shouldn't be blame, self-blame around right. it. There's somebody that calls that spiritual malpractice. Yeah. Pardon? Mm -hmm. There's somebody who calls that spiritual yeah. malpractice mm -hmm. when we start to think right. about it. Is it Ernest? Yeah. I was like, I can't remember where I heard it. There was somebody really, really smart that said that when we blame ourselves or when we start to get into that, mm -hmm. like not allowing ourselves things, that that's mm -hmm. right. And if you were, yeah, and our former assistant minister, um, Christy Corner, would would in classes would would be like, careful, you know, she would correct your language constantly when you were talking to her, and because there we have firm belief. Did she do, do that for you? Well, I do that to me, too. <laughs> <laughs> but she, Christy, would, would just rephrase it, rephrase it. She would say, rephrase it, rephrase it, rephrase it, rephrase it. Like that. She would just look at you, and you would change your word. And so, and because our words are so powerful, we, we'd be negating an affirmation like I was doing earlier. And, um, which is why writing is so important, because when I'm writing, they don't come out that way, right? But in my mind, I can be so, so many things going on that what pops out is subconscious and then becomes reality. When, when I'm writing, I feel like I'm writing consciously. Mm. I think maybe that's the difference. I just made that clear for myself. <laughs> you won't get um, so again, I'm just going to remind you that on page 63, the power is within, it's in four. There are 12 effects of holding firmly onto the omnipotence of spirit. You will have life, health, strength, support, defense, clear thinking, wise speech, ability to record well your ideas, joyous song, skill in carrying out your principles, beauty of discernment, and great love. That all comes with faith. I think that's beautiful. I think for all of us, that's beautiful. What a great discussion. Um, so we're going to move, we're going to jump into the works next week, the word of faith. No, six. We're jumping into six. <laughs> and this is the last of the first one. I believe so, understanding the secret of the Lord. Um, yeah, six powers. Quickening of power of spirit in our understanding. We must practice this science, this way of knowing to discover the secret, which you're the expert in. And... Um, <laughs> She was telling me on the break that she listens to it all the time in her car. So, um, and look at that. Emma Curtis Hopkins knew they were going to make that movie because she right. capitalized yeah. secret. <laughs> <laughs> what a mystic she was. All right. Any final thoughts? You, this table's been fairly quiet on that end of it. <laughs> 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 it was a pre
was. It really was. <laughs> would you anything you would like to add before we end? No. <laughs> no. No. Uh, no. Okay. Sure. People who've been kind of quiet this evening, would you like to share anything? You good? Janet, you good? Janet. This is Linda. I did it. I did it. Linda, are you good? Yeah. Okay. Good. Crazy? Yes. Okay. You good? All right. So let's do the offering. We'll just send one around. I'll just read this instead and do a treatment after. As the inspiration is the true breath of God, the God within and the God without are united by breathing. But the external breath of air into the lungs is only a symbol, a hint of the true breath or prana. And that is who we are. That is the true essence of who we are. And so let's just again hold the intention that we came with knowing that all is well, all is in its right and perfect place, that our path unfolds perfectly and with ease, and that we move easily and gracefully, and that the abundance and the prosperity of the universe is ours here now to share. And with every breath, we know that this is true. And as we breathe in the divine, we release all that is, that discomfort, that uncertainty and the doubt, and breathe in again, knowing that it is so, and so it is. And and so it is. is. And again, that I call on the divine to know and show the presence of the, of the wondrous love that is here with us tonight. And that each one of us are present in that love and feel that divine power flowing through us, guiding our way home, creating safe environments for us, and knowing that we are exactly where we need to be. And I know that this is true. I know that there is great prosperity, great love, and great health in each and every one of us, that our relationships blossom and flourish. And I know, and I am so grateful for this. I'm grateful for the presence of the divine in my life. I'm grateful for the presence of love by everyone here. And I'm grateful for knowing that this is all true. And as I release my words to law, they are acted upon with the grace kindness and joy of the divine that is present everywhere. And I say, and so, so it is. is. All right. So, it's a table thing tonight.